My name is Lars. I'm here for the first time at a better match, and it's pretty nice so far. And um, it's, also, it's also the first time someone from uh, Project Mesh is participating in a better in a better match. So I'm um, proud of that, and I want to tell you of Project Mesh and our routing software CJDNFs. And um, <laughs> Thank you. Right, Project MeshNet exists for quite some time already. Um, we're um, a loose collaboration of, uh, of developers, like software developers, website developers, um, and first and foremost, um, communities who, um, well, yeah, who build mesh networks in their towns, in their quarters in the city, and um, our goal is to replace the internet with something that's more democratic, uh, more open, more scalable, and um, right now we do this by building local mesh nets um, in cities where there are people and bridging them via the internet. And uh, eventually, um, there will hopefully be enough mesh nets to, to not need the internet to bridge them. And um, but that's a pretty long term project, so we're thinking in decades and not in months. And um, Yes. So the routing software we develop, we're developing, CJDNS, um, runs pretty much anywhere: Linux, Android, OpenWRT, macOS, FreeBSD, probably some others as well. And um, it's already used in the streets in Seattle and uh, in New York, where there's a pretty new and young initiative building up a mesh network. And um, its promise is basically near zero configuration networking. And um, I'll demonstrate that towards the end of the talk, and I hope uh, I can keep the promise. And um, yes. So CJDMS is a network of encrypted tunnels, either over Ethernet or over UDP. And um, encrypted means it's uh, using asymmetric crypto that you're pretty much familiar with, I guess. And um, so the start of, of every of every new CDDNS node is generating a key pair, and um, all the packets to you are encrypted with your public key, and you decrypt them with your private key. It's pretty straightforward. And your public key is also used to uh, derive your IPv6 address. So you can basically generate your own IP address, and there's no central or decentral authority for numbering our addresses. And um, so, yeah, we were fed up with ICANN, and so we just ditched it. And um, it has already found commercial applications. Um, it hasn't been usable for a long time, maybe half a year or a year, but uh, there's already the proper product called Enigma Box. It's a voice over IP appliance. You see a picture there. And, um, I'm, to be honest, I haven't ever had the, 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 the luck to, to get one in my hands and try it out, but people have told me it's, it works pretty well. And um, so, yeah, CJDNS is an IPv6 implementation. We don't do IPv4 or any, any other older protocols. And um, we restrain ourselves to the FC address space, which is reserved for unique uh, local unicast. So, it's more or less what we're doing, um, but the main point in it is it allows us to run alongside any existing networks. Um, yes, you can have <clears throat> you can have your device connected to the internet to any other IPv6 uh, networks to whatever you want, but um, you can still run uh, take part in the CJDNS network apart from that. And, um, yeah, anything that works with IPv6 works with CJDNS. Um, it's just no setup needed apart from, from starting CJDNS itself, but other apps or programs on your computer don't, or on your other devices don't need any additional setup. And, um, yeah. and it consists of a router and a switch, basically, which I'll come to in a second. Um, right, this is the step of generating a config I talked about that, uh, in the beginning. Um, it generates yeah, a bunch of JSON, um, a bunch of other configuration values apart from these. Uh, what you see here, you see here is uh, your IPv6 address, your public key, your private key, and um, 
It's being written to file, of course, to persist it. And then you can use the file to start the daemon. This uh, CJD web process is uh, anything, as uh, everything CJDNS consists of. As long as it runs, you're, yeah, you're running it. <laughs> and um, what, uh, yeah, there you can see it better. I have a different font size here. So uh, as soon as you start it, it creates a ton interface. Um, and it also creates a route for FC packages um, to, uh, to send them to this interface. And then the router can, uh, can take care of figuring out the routes and tend the packets to the switch. And um, yeah, but before your traffic can go anywhere, you need peers. So uh, if you're the only one in your area or anywhere running CJNNS, that's pretty useless because it's not really a network if it's only one node. Um, so you'd be looking for peers, um, and because the peers give you your initial routes and switch your traffic and um, provide connectivity to, to the larger network. And you can either peer using password authentication over UDP, that's what most deployments of CJDNS currently do because they're running over, because they're peering over untrusted wires like the internet or uh, or mobile carrier networks or whatever, but if you have a trusted line, um, for example in your home or your office or god knows where, then you can automatically peer over Ethernet. Um, CJDNS broadcasts uh, beacons over Ethernet and other nodes will pick them up and connect to you. And um, This allows for, for more democratic abuse resolution and uh, response to, to attacks like VDAS. Um, so the router, um, which I mentioned earlier already, takes the packages from the tunnel interface and it, uh, and it utilizes scalable source routing. It means it determines the route to the destination before doing anything else. And it discovers these route labels, so-called route labels, which are just paths, basically, paths uh, through the network, um, utilizing a dynamic, uh, Distributed hash table. I forgot it. <laughs> yeah, it has. Uh, it implements a distributed hash table and um, uses it to, to discover route labels from from other nodes that are um, that are numerically nearby to you. I'll come to that later again. And the route label is basically just a bunch of directions uh, through the links of the network. And um, from these route labels, you can uh, pretty much calculate the network topology. Um, if only you can get a hold of, uh, of enough packets. Like if you're running a CJDNS node in a network, you'll be switching traffic for all kinds of other nodes in the network, and you can just look at the route labels in the packets and use them to, um, to make sense of, of, of the larger topology. And, uh, and in order to, f to find better routes over time, like you start with the first best route you find, and then CJDNS um, continues to, to discover routes in the background and um, and weights them with a with a weighted dexterous algorithm. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, what uh, what this algorithm does, but it um, makes us have the best possible routes at any point. <laughs> Yesterday already, I was asked by several people about routing loops, and I had no idea whether routing loops are possible in CJDNS networks, but I asked the other people and they said the following. <laughs> um, scalable source routing is also used for forwarding in case in case a path or a route label is not yet known for a certain destination. And um, so there's a virtual routing ring being built up that looks a bit like this. I just took the picture from Wikipedia. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept. Anyway, the, the, the nodes in the network are numbered according to, to, to certain criteria, which in our case is, um, is the public key. And um, they're sorted by this number. So um, you can see it here. The packet starts at 1 and then um, traverses to, through the whole ring, 17, 32, 39, 42. And um, it only traverses nodes in this network which well it traverses the nodes in a in a in an increasing order. 
it can't um, it can't be forwarded to to a node which has a number that is lower than the previous one. So yeah. Exactly, yeah, and that's uh, how routing loops are impossible. Um, in normal operation, you could, if you have enough knowledge about the topology, you could forge packets with uh, with a with a kind of circular path, but it's not really a, not really a loop because this path this path would be uh, would would come to an end at some point, and yeah, you don't have a loop. In the worst case, at some point in the path, you could end up with uh, no more nodes to forward the packet to. Um, and then it would just be dropped. The packet, that is. The switch, uh, which takes packets from the router after, after the, the router has assigned a path or a route label to them. Um, because the router has already determined the whole path um, through the network that the packet needs to take. Um, switching is completely stateless. That means it can be implemented in hardware. Hasn't happened yet, but people are looking into it. Um, this, the switching decisions are completely based off the route label. Um, the route labels are, are eight bytes, and they look like this a bit. And uh, they are made up, made up of so-called directors. So um, each of these, yeah, each byte basically, it doesn't necessarily have to be a byte. The individual switch at the individual hops decides how many bytes um, of information he needs to make a decision on where to forward it. But um, basically, in most cases, this would be uh, five hops: the first hop, the second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, right. An example of how it roughly works: packet comes from peer A, and um, then the switch who receives it. Pops up, pops off the um, the first direction director, which would be the first byte in this case, the most uh, the least significant, and um, then figures out which of their peers, like the switcher receives it is the proper CJD in DNS node, obviously, and he has peering, um, and he figures out which of the nodes belongs to this director and passes the packet to it. But before passing it to the next one, it, um, back to that label once more, I should have put that on the other slide. Um, before passing it off, it, it has already popped off this segment, and it reverses it and puts it to the back. And reversing in this case means that before the switch received this packet, this um, The previous hop had a different segment here, which it popped off. And um, so what the current hop does is, after popping off the segment for the next one, it figures out the direction to the previous one, but from its own perspective, the reverse path from the one the packet took to the current one, um, and adds it to the back. And yeah, and if the peer is down, the peer it wants to send the packet to, it just reverses the whole route. Because um, this popping up and shifting and all that makes for reversible and repairable routes. And that way it can just reverse the route and send it back to, to the origin with an error message. And yeah. That's all very quick. It's stateless, it's, it's just a bit of bit shifting. It can be done in hardware. And um, the router is not, uh, not at any point asked what to do because the decisions have already happened. And um, unless it needs to be forwarded instead of switched. Um, that is the case if, uh, if, if there's just no known path from the current node and then it determines another node in the network which might know a path and forwards the packet to this one and lets it do the work. Um, there's a more detailed and certainly more, um, more understandable version of, of our description of the switch and the router. 
Um, in the source code of CJDNS, there's a white paper. Um, Hyperborea, this is part of a huge map. Um, Hyperborea is our test deployment, test and development deployment. And um, it's been running for like two years already, I think, pretty much since it started. And um, it has a couple of hundred nodes at any given time, mostly peered over the internet. But um, these mesh locals I mentioned earlier are also part of it. And um, that's why it's mostly over the internet. There are also some point of time point-to-point Wi-Fi connections and all that. Um, it's the place where the developer community meets mostly and discusses the work. And people have also deployed all kinds all kinds of usual services you find on the internet like GRC, GPG, a GitLab instance. Do you have it? Show the map once more. Um, my little VPS is the black dot here. And the colors of the of the other peers uh, of the other nodes indicate how many hops away it is. Like blue is one hop, uh, this lighter blue two hops, green three hops, and the orange and red nodes over there are well pretty far away. Well, we're developing CJNS. We're uh, offering only friend of the friend peering. We have public peering for some time where people could just um, peer freely into the network as they wanted but it caused too much problems, too much abuse um, and was was a too big distraction from the actual development work so we shut that off. And um, the entrance into the network is on FNet, IRC network, in, in the Project MeshNet channel and people just come there and discuss a bit, hang around a bit. Um, explain how, why they're interested, all that. Um, what I actually w already wanted to set up yesterday, but didn't find the time to, is this little box as a peering gateway into Hyperborea. You sh should watch out for it maybe today or tomorrow. It'll have a CJDNS named um, Wi-Fi, and if you connect to it and are a CJDNS node yourself, then, you'll, um, then it'll offer you peering into Right. I wanted to demonstrate a bit. Um, I promised a uh, near zero auto configuration, uh, near zero configuration networking in, in the beginning, and I have this router. I have a laptop. I have my phone, and I actually wanted to make it an ad hoc network, but the phone won't do it thanks to Google, who removed or added even a bit of code to WPA subpicken to block ad hoc networks. And um, yeah, I'll start with the router. How can I type with one hand? Let me see. So we have a we have a package field with pack with packages for OpenWRT. Um, Anyway, it's the usual kind of feed that you just add to your build route, and um, and afterwards you you just enable the correct packages. No. integration into the UI and then use the icon fix it um, and yeah you just enable it, build your firmware, that's it. Um, I don't want to risk flashing the router now so I have already so I'll just pretend I'll flash it and I'll pretend so by let's see by just deleting the config for CJDNS on the router so it'll kind of be in a in a vanilla state.
Maybe I'll show this config first. first. <laughs> it's um, basically just the UCI version of, um, of the JSON config that we generated earlier. Looks like this, it's pretty straightforward. Has all the options that we that we saw there previously at the six, public key, private key, a couple of more stuff, um, password credentials for peering in for uh, for allowing other people to peer with you, and the UDP interface that allows peering over UDP, obviously. Um, yeah. Anyway, let me delete that and start from scratch. So I copied uh, the, the script that sets the initial configuration using UCI defaults back to pretend we flashed it. And next thing I'm going to do is restart CGD accounts. And, and it should just execute it, generate a configuration, and let us run immediately. So there we go. And now we need to do the only configuration step that's necessary. Um, in the state that it's in right now, it'll allow um, anybody to peer with you over UDP, anybody offering a valid password. But what it doesn't do yet is. Oh, yeah, that was right there. What it doesn't do yet is uh, offer automatic peering over Ethernet. So, uh, add an Ethernet interface. That's not interfaces as in F0 or Bridge LAN or Wi Fi 0 or all that. It's um, interfaces in terms, of, um, in terms of switching directions that I talked about earlier. So,. Um, Anyway, that was, that was just confusing now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll add this, in, this interface, bind it to, to the LAN bridge, and enable the beacon mode. You can disable this automatic peering over Ethernet and only offer peering with password, or you can, well, enable it. Let's see. Probably, yeah, that's my laptop. It already has all that configured, and so it just, as soon as I updated the configuration and the Ethernet interface got created and started listening, it, uh, not started listening, but started broadcasting these beacons, um, it uh, picked that up, connected, and um, yeah. Next thing is the phone, let me see. So building for Android is really simple. It's just a matter of um, specifying a different GCC toolchain. And then you just get the, CJ, the CJD wrap binary, copy it over to the phone, and yeah. Right, that's it. I'm adding uh, the Android ARM toolchain. It's part of, part of the Android SDK to the path and pass the toolchain name to the cross compilation script and it's really fast and it's green or black. <laughs> While it's compiling, I'll get the phone set up.
All right, it's already finished. I obviously can't execute it because it's for, well, for my phone and not for my laptop. Um, I'll copy it over. So yeah, I already have a, a configuration, and the only thing I did was, well, generate it and then do the same thing I did on the router, which is enable the, um, the Ethernet interface. I can show this real quick. So that's what, what the whole configuration looks like in JSON. Um, yeah, that's what you see here. Um, Binding into the Wi-Fi interface, enable the, the beacons, and then I just need to start it. Make sure there's another process. All right, cool. So it has immediately forked into the background after setting everything up. Um, yeah, we already see it in the peer list. This one has a really bad latency because the Wi Fi is on channel 11, I think. Oh, no, it's better. Well, <laughs> but you get the idea. <laughs> Um, yeah, but that was just a little to-do list for the demo. Um, that's it, basically. Thank you. I'm here until Sunday for questions and all that. And um, yeah. Do you have questions? I'm sure you do. As far as I understood, you use IPv6 to send packets, right? How do you translate the destination of IPv6 into a node ID? So you use a DHT for routing, right? So each node is an ID in this DHT. And when you want to kind of package the routing, it's a destination which is IPv6. So I, I think you need a mechanism to translate from IPv6 into the real destination into the DHT. On the switches, you mean? On, I think it's the on, on, on every hop in the network or on, yeah, the, on the, the source? Um, no, you actually don't need that because you have these route labels that, um, that get determined and discovered already on the on the origin of the packet. Right, where was it? There. These look like these. And uh, these are what the what the values in the in the DHT are basically. The keys are kind of the IPv6 addresses and um, and the values are many many of these possible route labels. For every possible connection in the in the network, there's there's a couple of uh, or, or, or hundreds or I don't know how many routes um, because you can take different paths, obviously, and um, that's completely happening on on the origin of the packet. Does that answer your question? More or less, and maybe we can discuss this offline because maybe mm -hmm. somebody there is. So far, I understood it, it's an overlay, but of course, you claim we can do routing. So, it's when will you test it in the network here? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I already chatted with uh, Axel yesterday, and it doesn't seem so hard to set up. But yesterday, I had to well, prepare the slides, and I wasn't really well prepared. But that's for today. And I hope we can take part in the competition. I don't know if we'll be doing so well against uh, all the protocols who are smart about, about the Wi-Fi environment. But, um, yeah, definitely want to see how we do. <laughs> Go ahead. Someone originally, or a, a new person, 
sets it up and they get the number, what is uh, putting that number into uh, how is it that number would be adjacent to... Let me, let me show... Uh, do you mean, you mean these uh, direction numbers in the rust yeah. Let me let me show let me show um, a real world example maybe. I have this uh, this node that I showed on the map and I let me quickly well, get off the phone first. Come on. Um, this is the peer stats table of that node. Um, peer stats is just a little tool to get um, to get data right out of the right out of the running CTD wrap process, and it's all the peers, all the other nodes that my node is is peered with. It's like I don't know, 15 probably. And um, right on the left, there's the IPv6 address of, of the peers, and right next to that, there's uh, the route label that shows the, the direct route to them. And uh, you probably you can probably see it better there than in the slides. That you have these little directors here, and that means that the this peer, like C ninety six D, that's my laptop, um, is known to the switch on that node as well B two. So whenever a packet from somewhere on the network um, to my laptop takes a route that includes my um, my node here, then um, then the part B2, the director B2, will be the last part of the path. Um, you can see it's the first one is 1B, 1B, 19, 17, 15, 13, AE, AA, A6. Um, um, no, they are pretty much just um, just um, incrementing. Whenever you add a new peer to your to your node, um, CJD route or the, the router and the switch decide um, or, or figure out a, a new number, a new director for that node, and that's that's what they use for it, basically. And that doesn't probably answer your question. I am pretty sure I can get a good answer in a couple of hours from someone else. <laughs> um, do you think it's the best idea to run it uh, on the Wi-Fi interface? Maybe it's better to run it as an overlay network on, an, on top of an existing mesh network? I don't know what it's all, but it was. It pretty much assumes that, that you have no packet loss at all, that you have no latency. I mean, it, it can deal with it, but it doesn't cope with with all the all the weird shit that goes on in Wi-Fi networks. I mean, I don't know what smart stuff Batman and BMX and all the other protocols are doing there, but I'm sure it's a lot of smart stuff. Um, it basically runs best on cables at the moment. And uh, if you want to run it on Wi-Fi, go ahead, put it on top of Batman or some other protocol that has more knowledge of, of the environment. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I mean, you can run it on Wi-Fi, you saw it, but... But we know the problems of the Wi-Fi routing, existing routing protocols with the signal loss and such stuff. Yeah, yeah. your mileage may vary. <laughs> So 
So you're attempting to replicate all the services that you have in the normal internet? As, I, as far as I understand, it's kind of another internet. So how about DNS and other public services you have in the normal internet? Actually, I just listed all these services because they're facts. But I'm not a I'm not a big fan of, of, of replicating of replicating these centralized or decentralized services in the network. I'd rather I'd rather build federated federated alternatives to that. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, there are people in the community who like to set up SMTP servers or who like to set up central GitLab instances. Not a big fan of it. I would rather rather see. Alternatives being developed, as I said, um, but yeah, the the goal definitely is in the end to to yeah to replace the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we will be able to tell its success in fifteen or twenty years. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Well, I was more ah, about DNS, the DNS, DNS for example, DNS, yeah. really protocols mm -hmm. that you need. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of, if the average user is supposed to use that. Well, what we do right now as a kind of workaround, a hotfix for, for DNS is we, well, use the normal ICANN DNS and we use uh, AAAA records and just put the FC address in it. And um, that, of course, means that you're relying on the internet for your Hyperborea DNS. <coughs> and, well, it's a hotfix. For example, let, let me show you this, this GitLab instance. I hope I have connectivity to it right now. I sometimes get bad routes to gitwarrior.com. Yeah, there it is. And you see it's, it's a .com domain, so it's definitely ICANN, uh, but it points to an FC address. Um, that's, yeah, the hotfix we're doing, we're using right now. There are people looking into alternatives to DNS, like, Combining Namecoin, for example, with a DH, with a distributed hash table, stuff like that, but it's all very rough, not really usable, and it's more in a state of toying around with it, experimenting. But yeah, DNS is definitely an issue we're, we're facing. And, and IP address collisions, I guess, also are going to be an issue at some point. Um, well, you'd, in order to have a collision, you'd need to you'd need to generate a key. Whose, whose fingerprint uh, equals the fingerprint of an already existing well, key. Well, it comes back to Antonio's question. How do we, if I have a destination IP address, mm -hmm. how do I know, you know where, I, where, I'm, where the packets have to travel to? And if, I have, if there are two identical IP addresses, because that is what our computers communicate with, only then comes the key after. So some, at some point, you have to deal with the collision of the IP address. You have to make sure that you need or, I don't know, or there's some other way that I don't see. Well, right, uh, we have thought about collisions a bit. We, for, for now, we deem them too, too unlikely to, uh, to invest time in them. And what would probably happen is that, um, well, you have kind of a split brain state in, in the, the DHT. Because for the same IP address, there'll be routes to two different uh, destinations or to multiple destinations. And what probably happens then is that a couple of packets get there, a couple of packets get there, and you'd see packet loss on both ends. Um, but yeah, I'm really not sure how likely it is to, to have collisions. You'd need to generate, as, as I said, a, a, a key with this, the same fingerprint. Um, I, I don't understand where the key comes in. As I said, it comes back to the question. Your computer talks to IP address. Mm -hmm. So if you, you, you are connecting to whatever IP address, there is no key at that point. Well, the, it needs to be translated to a key at a certain point, which is not clear yet, at least to me and some others probably. The, the, the IP address of, of yourself is, is derived from, from the... From the, from the um, Fingerprint of the public key that you that you're getting right right in the beginning. Let me get back to that real quick. Uh, like in the beginning, when you generate a config, you have a private and a public key that are used for 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 the encryption of packets on the one hand, but on the other hand, for deriving your your IP address from it. And I think the algorithm we use there is. Salsa or something like that, but I might be 
telling us something one might know because I have no clue of cryptography. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, but what you would definitely need to do is, well, have a lot of bad luck to generate a key with the same fingerprint of an existing one, or find an attack vector to to the to the. <laughs> or a broken random generator. <laughs> Or that. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, how much of the F FC something uh, prefix are you using? Because normally, All of it. if you're using it, should only use a slash 48, and there are some rules what prefix you should be used for this. Because you might address, get errors conditions because other people use part of this address. Because you need local, it doesn't mean you should. We're taking all of them. I'm not sure what the reasoning for that is, but I think it's just to to maximize the well to maximize the space we have. Um, yeah, which thing this is a truncated hash. I think this is a truncated hash. Actually, you're using 120 of 128 bits. On the yeah, hash. exactly. So you truncate. That's it's that's a truncated hash. Uh, no, actually, we uh, we generate uh, keys until we have one where the fingerprint starts with FC. So we don't truncate the first two bytes, uh, the first byte, but instead we brute force until there's one that matches what we want. Um, sorry, I, but there was a different question, I think. Um, so you might the problem is you are breaking the concept of the unique local addresses. Probably, yeah. Is that you can have multiple networks using them, and you can combine them in a larger network, and they will have no collision because it's un it's unlikely because every one of them has taken a slash forty eight, and the prefix is selected by some hashing of the I think the timestamp in milliseconds when you did it. So that's the idea. So we uh, you it's not a, it's not only it's not meant as a purely private local thing, but also something you can combine with different networks. And when you take your whole range, of course, you break this. Not even sure if FC or FD is the normal unique local. FD is declared private, just private without any comment, I think. No, one of them is, the, uh, they are both the same, but one of them, they said they want to set up an authority that gives them away, but never did this. And the other one is with this randomized slash 48. I'm, I'm not sure either, but I'm definitely sure that FC is for for unique uh, for yes. unique unicast. Yeah. yeah, but normally there's a rule for the first uh, yeah. six bytes or something like this. Obviously. I didn't know that yet. Thank you. Question: Just what would you say to people interested in maybe in other projects like I2P, GNU Net, and Freenet that? There's other thing, and if the idea of CJ DNS is to kind of make another internet, how, how can we, um, yeah, when there's several different pr projects doing similar things, how can we kind of work together? What would you say is the advantage of CJ DNS? I, th I think all of these, and I think Freenet and Internet, ITP, Tor, uh, they have complementary goals with with uh, CJD, with CJDNS because CJDNS aims to build the underlying infrastructure, while um, and not caring for top-level concerns like anonymity, and um, you could totally run Tor or ITP or the others on, on top of CJDNS. Um, well, Tor not yet, I think, because it doesn't support IPv6 yet, as far as I know. But as soon as it does, nothing's keeping you from that. Yeah. You know the Netsuku project? Sorry? The Netsuku project. Netsukuku? Yeah. Never heard of it, no. Okay, have some aims and some overlapping goals, mm -hmm. but they don't have a real implementation. I mean, they have one right now, but it's still in testing. You might want uh, to look at the white papers they have for inspiration because they saw some DNS issues only, you know, theoretically, not practically. So yeah, that, that, that might be of some inspiration. Yeah, let's shut up to watch. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, thank you.